Good morning. We have a full schedule, so I wanted to get started right on time. Um, lots of interesting voices and perspective, lots of good debate, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. My name is Julie Caffley. I'm a vice president of the Public Policy Forum, and it's great to see so many of you and also the interesting perspectives that you bring to the room today. Um, I'm sure that many of you know each other, but uh, there's really a diverse uh, set of opinions and, and perspectives in the room, and we're delighted for that. I do bring greetings from our president, Ed Greenspan, who really wanted to be here, especially as his past um, in, as, as a journalist. Um, however, he's uh, accompanying uh, Minister Baines to an OECD meeting and was unable to be with us today, and he does bring his greetings. He's in his fourth month at president of the Public Policy Forum and uh, already starting to implement some exciting changes for us. So thanks for joining us today uh, to discuss the future of Canadian content in a rapidly changing digital world. Um, it's exciting times. Um, as many of you know, the Public Policy Forum has been around for 30 years. We're strictly nonpartisan. We look at breaking down the barriers between leaders from different sectors. As you'll see from the diverse opinions this morning on the panel, we look at building bridges, building trust amongst different perspectives to uh, lighten the best path forwards. We don't necessarily have an, an interest or a say in the outcome, we just want to get to the best on outcome. Um, through collaboration, we can find solutions uh, that break the mold of the conventional. When we do things the same, we get the same results. In April, the Honourable Melanie Joly, Minister of Canadian Heritage, announced the first phase of consultations on the Canadian content in a digital world. Um, we're excited to be part of those discussions and delighted to have many different uh, perspectives from government in the room today. Um, the challenges to Canada's cultural policies uh, would be the first major haul, overhaul in decades, and uh, we're glad to be part of that conversation. In the Globe and Mail article on April 25th, um, it summed up the, quite, the conversation quite uh, aptly when it said, everything is on the table. So to give you an idea, uh, this is what might be affected, the Broadcasting Act, the Copyright Act, Income Tax Act, CRTC Act, the CBC, the National Film Board, Telefilm Canada, the Council for the Arts, the Canada, Canada Book Fund, Canada Periodical Fund, the Music Fund, Media Fund, Tax Credits for Film and Video Production, and Export Promotion Funds. This will have a very uh, important impact on our cultural history, and the question is, how do we look at all of that in the digital age? So this morning we have perspectives from three different think tanks, and you'll see that the reports are, are outside the room from the Fraser Institute, the C.D. Howe Institute, and the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. We also have some cultural practitioners from Just for Laughs and the Alliance of Canadian Cinema, Television and Radio Artists. Um, and just before we begin, I'd like to thank our host, the University of Ottawa Continuing Education for hosting us in this beautiful space and obviously encouraging you to, um, to continue this discussion, to ask questions via Twitter. We will be looking at the Twitter feed to build into our question period later on at ppforum.ca or hashtag ppf16. And so you can tweet us your questions for those who are following on our webcast as well. And to begin, I'm looking forward to um, uh, introducing you to Zarka Nawaz. Uh, she's the creator of uh, a show that all of us know, The Little Mosque on the Prairie. And she's going to start off by provoking us, by challenging us on her, some of her insights regarding the future of CanCon. Narka? That. Can everyone hear me? I wanted to thank um, everyone for inviting me here today. It takes a lot of guts to invite a Muslim mid-Ramadan plucking us out from the prairies. My brain thanks you because we have special dispensa dispensation in when, while one travels, you're allowed to eat and break your fast. So I, <laughs> my brain thanks you for being allowed to have more energy and sugar into it. Um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Algonquin territory, on ceded land. Um, this is important for me to mention because I come from Saskatchewan, otherwise known as Treaty 4 territory. And it's something that I've learned about since moving to Saskatchewan. Um, the, what I wanted to mention is that I am a child of the Canadian cultural policy. I stand here before you not as a gynecologist that my parents had hoped I would become, <laughs> as a daughter of immigrant 
Pakistani parents. They had really, really hoped that I would go to medical school and follow you know, <clears throat> the traditional path. And in fact, the Canadian cultural policies that all of you have helped enact changed my route and brought me here today and basically made me a television writer and a comedy writer. And it was a very interesting journey that I went through when I first um, took a course at the Ontario College of Art. And I was trying to decide, should I become a filmmaker? Do I have something to say? What do I have to say? What, what could I say of value as a Canadian? And it was 1995, and I had to think of a topic for a short five-minute film. And I, you know, I was going through all these ideas in my head, and suddenly the Oklahoma bombing happened in the United States. I don't know if any of you remember. It was, it is still the, the most devastating domestic terrorist activity in the United States when Timothy McVeigh took a car bomb, no, a truck bomb, and detonated it in front of the Alfred P. Murray Federal Building because he was um, angry with the mishandling of the Waco siege that had happened. He killed 165 people. And at that time period, they were taking Muslims off planes and arresting Muslims for the, for the bombing. And then two days later, they arrested Timothy McVeigh. And I thought that was so interesting. This was 1995, that one you know, community was being stereotyped for someone else's crimes because no one had realized the, um, how big the right-wing movement in the United States was growing. So I made a short film called Barbecue Muslims. And it was about two Muslim brothers who are sleeping one night, and the barbecue blows up in the backyard. And they're immediately accused of being you know, Middle Eastern terrorists, and they're arrested by the police. And the actual terrorists were the anti-barbecue resistant front. It was a group against air pollution and carbon you know, in the atmosphere. This is 1995. <laughs> and so they're picketing in front of the police station, and they're saying, you know, they're trying to get attention for their cause. And they're arguing with one another, going, why would you go and blow up a Muslim barbecue? You know, of all the barbecues in suburban Brampton, why a Muslim barbecue? Now we'll never get attention for our cause. And the other guy was arguing, they don't label the barbecues and what faith group or owns them in the suburban backyards. We don't know. They're just, it's the dark, there's barbecues, we go and blow them up. It was our bad luck that it happened to be a Muslim family. And so this was like a, um, a satire on the issues that were happening in the day. And so I submitted it, you know, it was a terrible film. It was my, my brother and his friend in my, my mother's house. I actually got the neighbors in the area to come and act as the extras. And so, but I, you know, in my audacity, I submitted it to the Toronto International Film Festival. <laughs> And a few weeks later, I got a phone call from a programmer. <clears throat> the Toronto International Film Festival has a special shorts program for Canadian short films. And he said, there are going to be a lot of filmmakers who are going to be devastated that they did not get in <laughs> for this film <laughs> because they have made technically beautiful films and then there's this piece of work. <laughs> but we cannot deny the fact that there's no one else out there making original satires about Canada and terrorism. <laughs> and so based on its originality, we have to let it in. And I got programmed, you guys, on a, on a heartbeat. I got programmed. And it changed everything. Because once you get programmed in the Toronto International Film Festival, it opens all the doors for you. Because now you can apply to various cultural art grants in Canada and say legitimately, I have been accepted in this international film festival and put together money. So the Toronto Film Festival said, look, you have talent, but you need money. And you need to make a professional film with real actors, with a real crew, with real, te real technical expertise. We've opened this door for you, now go out and do something. And so I cobbled together about $30,000, this is back in 1997, and put together enough money to make a professional 20-minute film called Death Threat. And it was based on, back in the day when Salman Rushdie got the death threat for writing his book, Salma, you know, Satanic Verses, and Taslima Nasreen wrote her book. And so in the media, there were all this um, news about fatwas of death. And so I made a film about a Muslim woman who's written a schlocky novel, and she can't get attention for her you know, terribly written rom romantic novel. And so she decides to go and vandalize the mosque on purpose in order to get attention for her book and a publisher. And the mosque keeps you know, appeasing her and saying, what's wrong? Can we help you? Do we need to get you mental health services? Just let us know what you need. And so then she finds, she's realizing she's not going to get the death threat that she needs. And so she decides that she's going to write it herself. And she just needs an authentic group 
to sign it. And she realizes that the Hamas is speaking at the local university. So she figures this is a perfect, perfect group that will sign her $2 million death bounty. So she wears niqab to hide her identity and she goes to the university, except that she realizes once she got there that she had misread the sign and it wasn't a meeting of the Hamas, it was a cooking class for hummus. And only men were invited because men were too embarrassed to learn to cook in front of women. So it was a Canadian comedy based on cultural policy and cooking and terrorism and the whole issue of death threats. And that got accepted in the Toronto International Film Festival, who was very happy to finally see something worthy, <laughs> technically, of the festival. And so I was making these cookie films when the National Film Board of Canada approached me and said, we'd like you to do something a bit more serious. You know, you're obviously good at satire and comedy, but we'd like you to put your talents towards something a little different. Think of a documentary that you would like to make about something that really, really matters to you. And at that time period in my life, I grew up in Toronto, but I had married my husband who was from Saskatchewan and I had moved there. And we were going to the mosque. It was a local grassroots community mosque and men and women prayed together in the main prayer hall. But we, an imam came from Saudi Arabia and he felt that there was too much intermingling between the men and the women. And he felt he needed to you know, put his foot down because culturally in his country, men and women were, lived parallel lives and this is like a very austere form of you know, their interpretation of Islam. And he wanted that to be interpreted in our mosque. And he, one day I came to the mosque and there was a curtain between the men and women. And I knew that this had not, this, there was no um, scriptural basis for this type of extreme um, division between men and women. This was a cultural interpretation. And it was based on patriarchy and misogyny. And, but people were mistaking theology for tradition. And so I needed to talk about this and get the community. I had the ability living in Canada and the freedom to be able to bring out these issues in the Muslim community and to start talking about the issues of patriarchy and misogyny in a way that other Muslims living in Muslim countries were not able to do. So I, create, I, I, I made a documentary called Me in the Mosque. And, it was, and I went across the country and in the United States and talked to imams and men and women about why these practices were entering our community and how we could fight against them. And the easiest way was to open people's eyes and say, this, is, this doesn't actually originate from the faith. This originates from cultural interpretations that people have mistaken for faith. So I made that documentary, Me in the Mosque, and the Banff Television Festival, I was sent there by the National Film Board to present the documentary, and I asked a friend of mine, why do people go there? And she said, primarily to pitch television shows. People primarily go, you know, uh, um, to pitch TV shows to producers who come from different parts of Canada. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, because I was gonna be there for, I think, two or three days, and I didn't wanna waste my time. So she gave me a template of a television show she had created. And so I looked at it, and, you know, it had like a log line, and it had, um, like the key players of the television show. So I sort of, in, in the back of my mind, me in the mosque, I had just made this documentary and I thought to myself, what would change a Canadian mosque for the better? And I thought, any mom who, were, who was born and raised in Canada who believed passionately in gender equality, what if he became an imam and ran a mosque in Canada? How would that change the whole atmosphere of mosque culture? And so that was where the idea of Little Mosque on the Prairie came from. So I started pitching it to various producers at the Banff Television Festival. And people started saying to me, you don't realize how seriously you're being taken here. Like producers are quite enamored by this idea. And I was like, but why? Like this is just a silly idea. Like how, you know, what, what could it possibly mean? But when I got back to Saskatchewan, um, I had partnered with West Wind Pictures, a production company in Regina. And the comedy director came through Saskatchewan, except, you know, he wanted to hear the pitch, and he said, you know, we'd like to take this into series. We'd like to develop this idea with you and actually make it into a pilot. And we didn't think of it at the, t um, take it that seriously at the time, because back in those days, Canada wasn't known for sitcom, success in sitcom. I mean, the basic wisdom out there was that we just couldn't do it. We couldn't make sitcoms. It was something the Americans could do, but as Canadians, we couldn't. We only had had maybe two successes, King of Kensington. Do you guys, does anyone here remember King of Kensington? And The Beachcombers, I think that was it, right? Those two shows, and people had tried and tried for years, but we hadn't managed to cross that divide. And so there was just a sense that it was just something Canadians didn't do. And so nobody was really, so I wasn't really paying attention, you know, when, when people were saying, this is serious, they're actually gonna make the pilot. But 
but who was taking us seriously were the Americans, right? So when word of this got out that Canada was making was developing a comedy series with Muslims. And not even like the Cosby show, right? Where you're having a family with a couch in a living room. Not something like benign, but doing a comedy about Islam in a mosque at a time when we had just come off the 2005 Danish cartoon controversy, right? So the whole world was agitating. You know, there was worry that Muslims couldn't handle comedy or taking a joke. And then suddenly Canada, all the countries in the world decides to make a comedy based in a mosque about Islam. Like who were we as a nation to think that we could get away with something so controversial. And so suddenly, the New York Times and CNN, all the American medias started calling us for interviews and asking us what we were up to. And I remember the CBC saying, don't say too much, because we don't want to give away too much. But the trouble was, as Canadians, we just didn't have the millions and millions and millions of ad dollars that American broadcasters have to advertise their shows and get Canadian eyeballs off of American shows onto Canadian shows. But inadvertently, we suddenly got money that you know from advertising that we couldn't possibly buy through the Americans. Because then suddenly, the Canadians started paying attention. The Canadian media was going, why are, there, why are the Americans paying attention to this one show? So by the time we um, premiered, 2007, we had record ratings. I think the last time CBC had ratings that high were 20 years prior when Anne of Avonlea, or the television series, had aired on CBC television. And then we came on the heels of Corner Gas. Do you guys remember Corner Gas? So strangely enough, for, for a country that was never known for sitcom success, two shows come out of Saskatchewan, the province that you wouldn't think of, right, as the place that would make sitcoms. And in, so Indian Head and Rouleau were the two cities that the two shows were being shot out of. And suddenly the, you know, the production um, companies flocked to Saskatchewan and we had this industry that started growing in Saskatchewan for making television. But what was fascinating to me was that the intensity of the media that I was getting from around the world, like I remember just being overcome by all the attention that I was getting. And, I, and like I asked, you know, I, particularly from Europe, like Europe was paying attention to the show. And, you know, I even had a Swedish film crew come from, Sw from Sweden to Regina to interview me. And I was like, why, why this intensity and, and all this interest in the show? And they said, you don't understand. Like you made this show as an example of what your life in Canada is, but what you have inadvertently done is exposed a nation that has plurality, has cultural flexibility, has integration of the Muslim community in your country in a way that has failed drastically in Europe. And I hadn't realized it at the time, but Muslims were a marginalized group in Europe and continue to be because of the history of um, Muslim migration into Europe. And they were watching this show with other fascination because they had never seen a Muslim community integrated successfully in terms of economics and education and employment fully in a country before. So we were actually exporting a piece of Canada, our success, without realizing it. And I had not a clue that that's what was going on because I had made it because I was mad about, uh, mad about that Saudi guy in our mosque. And, and it was my act of protest as a woman and as a feminist to prove that this is not Islam and this is not my religion and I can make a show that could you know, show what Islam could be for women and for men and you know, gender equality. And yet the Europeans were watching it for an entirely different reason. They were utterly fascinated with it. And then the Americans picked up the show, and it streams on Hulu, which is sort of another Netflix in the US. And I was just in New York last week on a comedy panel, and I asked for, you know, this is, I'm gonna show you a clip of what the Americans saw last week of the show, because it completely floored them. Mario, can you play that, please? Finally, our own mosque. No more scuffling around from one basement to another. Well done, Yasser. A small town mosque in a church. I don't understand why you didn't just tell them about the mosque. Yeah. Yes, this is a good one. Reverend, I would like to run a mosque out of your parish hall. Would you like to tell Jesus or shall I? A new imam from the big city. I've been planning this for months. It's not like I dropped a bomb on him. This is Allah's plan for me. Oh my. American idol, Canadian idol. I say all idols must be smashed. Painted your tape last night, said this oh, It was so good. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? Step away from the bag. You're not going to paradise today. 
Allahu Akbar. I saw them bowing and moaning just like on CNN. They're Muslims. They pray five times a day. Yeah, is this terrorist attack hotline? You got people walking down Main Street in burqas. Next thing you know, you got public beheadings and people eating figs. Muslims around the world are known for their sense of humor. I did not know that. Oh, oh. What oh. is your relationship with this mosque? I'm Omar Rashid. I'm the new Imam. It's like a priest or a rabbi, only browner. Assalamu alaikum. I am Yasser yes. Hamoudi. And this is my wife, Sarah, Hi, my beautiful I'm daughter, Sarah. Diane. This is Rayanne. Welcome, welcome to our little mosque on the prairie. Would it kill you, Muslim gals, to show a little cleavage now and then? Would it kill you if I hit you with a cleaver? Canada's highest rated comedy premiere. So? You look like a Protestant. Don't you mean prostitute? No, I meant Protestant. 91 episodes over six extraordinary seasons. I thought you'd drag us into the modern world, or at least the 11th century. You have to help me! My congregation's coming apart at the seams. No, no! Use your muscles! In Pakistan, we can move 10 women at a time! A worldwide success story. Any words of wisdom? No, not really. No. I've never prayed so much in my life. So this aired in, in the United States in this panel, and you, you could just imagine the look on the Americans' faces. And for me to put this in perspective, the last time the Americans tried to get a show even remotely um, resembling anything like this was a few years ago on TLC. Have you heard of a reality TV show called All American Muslims? It was about the Lebanese Shia Muslim community in Dearborn, Michigan. And so they aired, they were able to get, pa oh, okay, I will wrap this up very shortly. It was um, a reality show, and it aired, and the moment it aired, it was just, just you know, about Muslims this, you know, playing football, going grocery shopping, you know, the usual TLC shows, and n not even practicing Muslims, right? These were like regular Muslims, um, a secular Muslim community. And um, one man one, uh, created, his name was David Catan. He was a born-again Christian. He formed the Family Florida Association. Of, you know, so he's the only member of this Family Florida Association. And he claimed that this show was whitewashing Muslims and showing them as normal people. And that would ultimately cause the terrorists to win because Americans would be... Um, I guess feeling like everything was fine, Muslims were ordinary people, and that they would trust them. And so he went to the advertisers and said, look what you're advertising on. You're advertising on a show that is potentially lethal for Americans to be watching, ordinary Muslims who are regular, because it was not othering the Muslims as um, t terrorists. They're, it was showing the Dearborn, Michigan community, which is the highest concentration of Muslims in the United States, as regular Americans. And it was a reality show because they were regular Americans. So 65 advertisers pulled out their um, advertising, and Lowe's um, was the one that was caught and had a huge petition and backlash against them, saying, why are you giving in to this bigoted, it's like one man, right? <laughs> it's not even like a large group of people. It's one person who had formed this organization. And so after about eight episodes, they canceled the show because Islamophobia in the United States, and this was before Donald Trump, is so severe that it can affect advertiser um, confidence in a television show. So that was how difficult it was for anything that has a positive representation of Islam and Muslims to get on to the American airwaves. So I would say to you, probably Little Mosque on the Prairie is the only show in the world that could have possibly been made because of the country that we live in and because of the cultural policies that we have that protect broadcasters like CBC and encourage them to represent the diversity um, that exists in this country. And I know that the question is, how do you measure um, how do you measure a show like this? How do you know if it's actually making a real change? And I, you know, if you had asked me this question a month ago, I would have said, I don't know how you measure anything. But then I was in Walmart shopping for um, an area rug for my house, which I still haven't been able to do. But anyways, I was there and my cell phone rang and it was a reporter from CNN. And she said, have you heard about the study? And I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, well, at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, a graduate student um, decided to study Little Mosque on the Prairie and to see if it actually had a measurable um, 
if you can actually measure people's reactions to that show. So she got six episodes of Friends, you know that show, Friends, that six white people, right, as the six, as the six leads, and then six episodes of Little Mosque on the Prairie, and they decided to measure people's reactions to the show, and they had like, um, I'm assuming, you know, diversity, prejudice, racial prejudice, all those criterion, and so, the, so they had the two control groups watching the two different shows, and, and then they measured it afterwards. And sadly, the measurements for the people who watch Friends stayed exactly the same, and, but the people who had watched Little Mosque on the Prairie, the measurements changed because they were relatable Muslim characters. That even though they had never met them in their real life, this was the closest that they had come, and it actually changed the way they perceived an entire community. And she said this was the first time that someone had qualitatively measured racial prejudice and how it could change by watching television. And I was like blown away. I was in Walmart trying to buy my mat. And she's like, what do you think? And I was like, oh my God, right? Like you, you, know, you don't know how powerful the medium of television can be. And you don't know even if you make a show from it for an entirely different reason, how we can go out in the world and become you know, an ambassador for your country, for how your country operates, for how it integrates its minority communities, how it can change the way how people integrate into a society and how people think about that society, particularly in today's time when we are probably facing, you know, a fundamentalist in Donald Trump and probably possibly like the most significant election in the American politics that we've ever seen. And we are a country that holds, you know, incredible pride in who we are and what we can be and how we are different from the rest of the world. And we should be very proud because we are unique in the world and continue to be more unique <laughs> as we go forward. And I wanted you to think about these stories that I'm telling you as you make your decisions because what we do as Canadians makes a qualitative difference in the, in the product that we put out and how that is being consumed by the world and how they consume it and how they react to it and how they think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Zarka. Thanks for being um, an activist, a trailblazer, and for not being a gynecologist. <laughs> Um, I'll ask the panelists to come up as I'm introducing them. We're delighted to have a, a very rich discussion right now. It will be moderated by Laura Payton, who many of you know is Parliament Hill online producer for CTV.ca. We also have our panelists, John Anderson from the Canada Centre for Policy Alternatives, Ben Dacus from CD Howe, Fern Downey, who's the president of ACTRA, an international federation of actors, and Eric Lapointe from Just for Laughs. Thank you for joining us. We're going to start with each of the panelists giving a quick like, one-minute summary of their positions. Uh, ben and John obviously have just written reports um, for the C.D. Howe Institute and for the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, so I'd like for them to be able to summarize so that you're aware of sort of what the reports say and uh, where the discussion's going today. So let's start at the end with John from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Hi. Uh, and I am timing you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my name is John Anderson, and I'm an independent researcher. I was previously uh, policy uh, director for the uh, NDP at the federal level uh, when it was the official opposition, um, and uh, I also have worked for the uh, uh, in the cooperative sector for many years. And I've also worked for uh, CBC uh, National and uh, the CBC News World in the old days. Um, uh, my paper essentially looks at uh, the fact that Canada has become radically out of step with most countries in the world and how we treat uh, the over-the-top uh, media purveyors such as Netflix, Google, etc., and pos possibly more, more of these in the future, the, for the, the big, big foreign-owned uh, purveyors. Um, I think it was just... Uh, Last week, a uh, statistics uh, survey showed that there's now over 5 million households in Canada which have Netflix. So this is a very, very important and growing uh, phenomenon. But unlike uh, the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, we do not uh, tax or regulate uh, these companies. Um, and to me, this is a very serious problem for a whole series of reasons. And so in my report, 
have a, I go through the history of why, you know, why that has occurred and why it's not a good thing that we John, don't do it. John, you've got to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but essentially, my view is that we should be uh, 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 regulating these, these companies. We should be uh, uh, making them collect uh, value-added taxes as well as making them pay income tax and making them contribute to uh, Canadian culture um, uh, programming. And that uh, this, is, this is not an unusual thing. This, this would only create a, a level playing field with, uh, with, with the private Canadian companies and, and with, with, with uh, uh, state-owned broadcasting in Canada. And I, so I think this is something we should do. And uh, uh, in the course of the discussion, we can get into some how we would do it, et cetera. That's right. Uh, and just a reminder, please everyone tweet at ppforum. Dot, or sorry, at ppforumca or hashtag PPF16 uh, with Twitter questions or if you're going to live tweet so that people can follow along. Um, ben. Thanks. The, uh, the quiz meter, is this on? Is it on? Is it on? There, there we you go. go. Uh, so they quizzed us earlier on uh, getting down to one minute, so hopefully I'll pass the test this time. Uh, so what we at the CDI Institute, we're a national nonpartisan public policy think tank whose mission is to improve Canadian living standards by fostering sound economic policy. So as part of that, uh, looking at uh, telecoms and broadcasting was pretty high on, our, high on our list of subjects. But the basic point of our, our paper, and you can see it uh, out front, and hopefully many of you have it in front of you, is that the television world today is just very different than the uh, world in which uh, the CRTC and many of the Canadian broadcasting regulations came from in the 1950s. And we at, the, we at the Institute, in our paper, we came up with three broad reforms that the upcoming federal review should really focus on. Uh, the first is that the federal government needs to stop relying on broadcasters to finance Canadian content. And that's broadcasters of all kind. And instead, Ottawa really should be, um, instead, uh, directly supporting, uh, connecting Canadian content with audiences uh, through general government revenues. Second is that the CRTC should not have uh, a heavy hand in setting many of its regulations. And what the CRTC should be doing instead is applying a lot more rigorous economic analysis in its hearings, along the lines of what we see the Competition Bureau subject to. And uh, third, the federal government really should be cutting the rules on who owns what in the sector. Uh, you see this in a number of regards, first on Spectrum, second on the companies themselves. And instead, again, we should be relying on, the federal government should be relying instead on the Competition Bureau to deal with anti-competitive conduct in a Spectrum ownership. And you can, uh, it can rely on the Investment Canada Act protect important parts of the sector. So that I'll turn over to the next person. Great. One of the exciting things I think about this panel is in Ottawa we deal with a lot of researchers and reports, but today we have two actual practitioners here. So Fern, please give us your perspective on, on Canadian content. Surely. My name is Fern Downey. I'm an actor and I'm the national president of ACTRA and the international president of FIA, the Actors Unions of the World. I've worked and collaborated with writers, directors, producers, all my creative life for 30 plus years, and that's the world that I inhabit. I too am a child of a Canadian creative community. I would describe myself as a passionate Canadian and a believer in balanced, fair regulation in a very pragmatic sense. And I believe that our film and television industry is in, a, in an area of success and ascendancy right now in large part because of successful government regulation. Government has played a leading role in the past and they need to play a leading role in our future. Um, times are certainly are changing, are they not? There's no doubt we need to evolve. We all here on this panel know that. But the internet age has produced some of the biggest, hugest, most multinational conglomerates in the world. We call them FANG, the, uh, these, these titans of the world. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. And, and they're in the culture business big time. But that's why I believe the government in Canada's role is more important than ever. And as we live next to the biggest cultural producer and exporter in the world, uh, our government has, needs to continue to play a key role in creating the kind of fantastic work that we do currently, like Little Mosque on the Prairies. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Eric Lapointe. I'm the Senior Director of International Sales at Just for Laughs uh, and also in charge of uh, digital development. So one of the things I do is to try to exploit our content as much as possible uh, on digital platforms such as, uh, well, we're talking a lot about Netflix today, but other platforms like YouTube, Facebook, uh, and, and even new platforms that are emerging like, uh, like Snapchat that we're currently exploring. Um, I think ultimately I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm, I'm definitely not um, a regulations expert like uh, 
like the others might be, but I'm interested in, in this topic today and to be part of the conversation. I think Just for Laughs um, obviously has the success that it has because of the system that is currently in place. Uh, that being said, I mean, the times are, are changing indeed, and uh, we do need to start taking a look at what should we do um, with, the, um, with the changes. Eric wins the prize for coming closest to a minute. <laughs> All right. Um, we heard from John that Netflix has an estimated 5 million Canadian subscribers. They're aiming at 100 million worldwide, I think, by the end of this year. How many of you pay your HST on your Netflix subscriptions? Put up your hands if you do. That's because they don't charge it. You're supposed to remit it yourself as well. Same thing with iTunes. Um, so without... Netflix and other over-the-top providers paying, ta uh, paying corporate taxes in Canada. They don't collect HST. Um, they are putting in place Canadian productions. There's seven productions going on right now in Vancouver. They just announced another one this morning. They're going to do a production of Alias Grace uh, based on the Margaret Atwood novel. Um, so Eric, uh, because you sell to, to uh, you sell Canadian content to programmers around the world. Is Netflix overall, is it a bigger challenge or an opportunity for Canadian producers? I wish I sold to Netflix to be able to better answer that specific question because um, we're, Just for Laughs is currently not on Netflix. Um, and we're picking on them because they're the biggest, they're very popular in Canada, but it, the same applies to other, other content providers. Um, I think it's a challenge to uh, Canadian producers because... Um, like you said, they come into this country, we don't pay taxes on it. Uh, sure, they create great content in Canada if they can, but they're not, there's no minimums. Uh, uh, sorry, there's, yeah, there's no minimums. So they, um, so I think right now what's happening is a lot of uh, Canadian producers who could work with Netflix don't necessarily get that opportunity. And Netflix should play by the same rules as uh, pretty much everybody else. And John, you've got some specific recommendations in your report. Yes, well, I mean, I think that, that uh, as, as is happening in, in Europe, the European Union, and, and, and already in France, uh, <clears throat> Netflix is, is, is being forced to contribute to a certain percentage of, of sales to the, contri uh, to the creation of, of, uh, of uh, local programming. And, uh, you know, we, we do this for our, our big, uh, our, our BDUs here, uh, such as, as, as uh, uh, Rogers and Bell, etc. But we don't uh, we don't do this with Netflix. And uh, Netflix should just be playing on the same on the same level f uh, playing field as the other ones in terms of, of what the, what they have to contribute. It's not they should contribute more; they should contribute the same the same amount. That's important. I, I mean, I just also like to mention that what's in, what's particularly in, incredible is the influence of these companies that they even have an exception c clause to regulation in the draft TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. So the, the, they're the only people who have an exception to, to regulation in, in terms of Canadian culture are these companies. So they have tremendous power, they have tremendous influence uh, over successive Canadian uh, governments. And I think that we have to uh, really make sure that they uh, they do what, what is necessary in terms of, of, of creating uh, Canadian culture. And, and, and I'm sure that's an opportunity, it can be an opportunity but they should be regulated in the same way. So, I mean, I, I'm a Netflix subscriber. Uh, so, I mean, it's not that I don't watch Netflix. It's not that they don't have good programming. But they should have, they should be forced to contribute this in the same way as the other BDUs do. And we should know, we don't have anyone from the Fraser Institute here today. They weren't able to join us. But their report takes sort of the opposite um, position, which is that rather than regulating Netflix for CanCon and making them pay their taxes, the providers who are in Canada should be more deregulated. So that's the other perspective that, um, that we don't have here in front of us. Uh, ben, you'd like to jump in. I would say that at least the, the folks here on, on the panel all kind of agree with the same broad principles, that we should have a level playing field uh, and that we should promote Canadian content. The thing that we're all just dis we're, we're, we ha we're having a disagreement about is really just the mechanisms. That's, that's all that the discussion really has to be about, uh, at least with, it, with this government. There, there will be support for Canadian content. There's no question about that. It's now a matter of finding out what's going to work in the in the in the world of the internet. Now, when it comes to you know going after Netflix, you know they're a big company, they're an easy target. But how do you define a, a taxing a you know GST and HST are one thing, and that's the topic for you know 
brought you know, at, at the OECD level on national uh, tax avoidance that we have to have a serious conversation about that also includes services like, like Uber. Uh, and you can't go too far down that road with, uh, with Net Netflix because you may not pay your HST, uh, but I guarantee a lot of folks here are geo-spoofing their Netflix to get around the Canadian content rules and, and being able to get, uh, get the U.S. content because that was your way to get cheaper U.S. television. I bet you a lot of, a lot of folks would do that. So there's a limit as to how far we go on um, taxing Netflix. But on top of just going after Netflix, how do you go after Facebook, Snapchat, uh, YouTube? How do you come up with a, a comprehensive uh, taxing system, regulation system, that creates a level playing field where all these different companies with different business models have to chip in? So our recommendation is just forget about trying to, to get the money from the, from the broadcasters. We have a general public good here of promoting Canadian content. Let's, do that. Let's promote that Canadian good from all, from all Canadians through general revenue. We heard a little bit from uh, Eric about selling Canadian content abroad. Fern, what do you see as, are, are we having success already? I mean, we heard about how well Little Mosque on the Prairie is done. Are we having success, or other Canadian producers having success that way? Currently, we're having success in our country because of the maturity and the level that we've achieved in our production. And that's because of all this balance and investment and understanding. And we have a very lumpy playing field right now in terms of the, the online broadcasters, which is what I will call Netflix for the purposes of this discussion, aren't contributing to the creation of Canadian content, original Canadian content. And they're certainly evading what should be their tax duty, which our government has not yet imposed, although the rest of the world is quickly advancing in that that field. So we are creating stunningly good creative content that is exportable, and I love the explosion of opportunity that the digital universe buys us. I love that we can license regimes all around the world, but you have to be reinvesting in the creation of the content to have that work to export. And if you don't have the online broadcasters making a contribution to the funds that are available in our country, where will that, where will the creative community find their support? And as we know, the minister is undertaking a policy review right now. We've talked, I think, a little bit about the Canadian um, CMF. I just blanked on what it means. The media fund, the Canadian media fund. Um, Fern, what do you see as the, the, the benefits to it right now, and how would you change it if you could run that policy? If I could run the CMF? Oh, <laughs> money for everybody. Um, well, the Canadian Media Fund exists to, to nurture the creation of Canadian content clearly. So right now, uh, all the BDUs are contributing, what is it? Um, if you have 2,000 subscribers, you have to do 5% of your gross broadcasting revenues. And those are, the <coughs> technical term is broadcast distribution undertakings, but it means the, the providers, right, the service providers. That's right. And so then that goes into a, an, an, a fund that is very well administered and very efficiently administered, and the creative community applies to that fund to invest in their new content. So how do you keep replenishing that fund? If cable cutters, at, I don't know uh, what the numbers are of cable cutters this morning. It seems to change every second of the day. But what I'm more fascinated by are the number of people that are not cutting their cable because the television, uh, the quality that you can view at home is so phenomenal. Um, but it's just keeping money going into that fund or, or similar funds that renew the cycle because I go back to the beginning every time. So I think you have to have an adequacy of funding to begin and initiate the process. Okay. And Eric, what are foreign buyers looking for when you're trying to sell content to them? Well, I sell mainly hidden camera and, uh, and stand-up, English language stand-up. Uh, what are they looking for in general from Canadians? I would say they're looking for good content. I don't think they're necessarily looking for Canadian content. I think we do have an opportunity to make sure that we produce even better content so that, um, so that we can become the, the next buzz. And I think the way that it's set up right now, I think we do have to talk about um, how the, the structure is right now because I, I think right now we're in the situation where um, be, because of all the competition, we're having, we're having a, a definitely hard time to, um, to continue pumping out content internationally. Um, You're talking about the, the structure of the CMF or of... Uh... Well, I'm just thinking about like certain countries right now are the buzz of the world. Like Turkey right now is creating these telenovas that the whole world is talking about. And then, so right now it's like Turkey, Turkey is, every, is what is the country that everybody's been talking about in the last two, three years, and that's gonna come and go. I think it's high time that, um, that Canadian is back on that map to recreate that buzz 
and start pumping out more content. But I think we're kind of in this weird zone right now where it's, it's, not, it's not structured at all whatsoever. And I'm kind of like on the fence because I, I think I lean towards John's report where it says, well, we need to continue to regulate. We need to continue to, to do that. But I think there's some good ideas in the CD Howe report to directly subsidize content, especially niche content. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's just not, not at all an easy task. Okay, Ben, you wanted to respond? Yeah, and w you make a point about, you know, the competition need to be, you know, compelling television that attracts eyeballs. We have, we have created many of our regulations for television of broadcast quotas in a world where it was effectively force feeding what people watch and say uh, evening, uh, evening prime, prime time and a certain amount of content uh, on the overall <coughs> channel over the, course of, over the course of the day. We are now in a world where people can get what they want, when they want, where they want. And this idea that we can just uh, you know, tell companies, oh, you must present this Canadian content, or you must, you must have this uh, on here, when people just decide to watch something else um, and that isn't supported by Canadian, but isn't Canadian, well, we have to recognize that world. And we need, to, we need more Just for Laughs. We need more Little Mosque on the Prairie that is compelling television. And so this, this idea of, of um, you know, supporting Canadian content, the old mechanisms of those content uh, quotas that we still have on Canadian broadcasters, it just isn't going to work. We need more of the direct subsidy model and let the competition, let the competition for eyeballs uh, make, the, make the final decision as to what gets watched. Speaking of competition, in your report, you write about uh, the CRC, CRTC kind of ceding a bit of its role to the Competition Bureau and using pure competition law. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So this gets to the model of thinking about what's the best kind of competition in a world where technology is changing rapidly. When you, you, th you, if you, when you think about the kind of rules that we have with the CRTC where they say, uh, have specific rulings on a specific kind of technology, that's very, that's very hard for companies to work, work with nowadays when, you know, in, f in five years from now, it'll be a completely different kind of technology. Uh, whereas what would happen if the Competition Bureau had, um, had the final say is that the general, general principles of competition would apply no matter what kind of technology we have. And so, 20 years ago when it was just television broadcasts and that's what you that's what you had and that's what you watched you know the CRTC could be a sector specific regulator but now with, with change, rapidly changing technology we need the broader principles of, 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 of competition policy that can apply to no matter what technology comes out five ten years from now John I think you might disagree well I mean I, th I think exactly because uh, uh, the business environment is radically changing in terms of, of, of how television programming is delivered. It's all the more reason why we cannot simply rely on the, uh, you know, on something like the Competition Bureau. We couldn't, we couldn't go to that. We've got to, in fact, what we've got to do is, is strengthen the CRTC. CRTC has been very, very weak during the last decade. And in fact, in my report, I go through all of the many ch possibilities they had of, 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 of regulating the uh, over-the-top services and how they sort of backed away at each moment. I think you know now is the time to to move into this, like other countries have done. And this is not a, a this is not a left-right uh, uh, issue. It's important to note that uh, Australia and New Zealand, both of which have conservative governments, are now regulating and taxing uh, 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 the. Uh, e-commerce and Netflix uh, in those countries. And that's just recent that they're doing that. And the European Union, it's, it's all the different countries. And you know, certainly one of the reasons in, 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 in Europe has been there has been a much more of a, of a, of a movement there to, to reveal what some of these co companies are, you know, how many taxes they're not paying, like Google and, and Facebook, et cetera. And uh, we, haven't, we haven't broken through that, <laughs> and Netflix, we haven't really broken through that yet in Canada to get that kind of information. But, but certainly, uh, I, I think that we, that's the route to go. And I don't think that, the, that having things regulated by the Competition Bureau is the, is the idea. It's not that competition is bad. Competition is good. That's not the problem. The problem is the regulation of that competition. And we need, the re we need that competition to be regulated uh, through the CRTC. Uh, and what makes it a more complicated kind of uh, competition that needs CRTC regulation as opposed to doing it the way all the other industries are regulated. Right. So if you're going to the, the, going to the CRTC uh, on whatever, be it fiber to the premises or Netflix, sorry, the pick and pay ruling, the CRTC is sort of a, a law unto itself. Uh, when you're dealing with the Competition Bureau, there is this vast amount of jurisprudence 
that, uh, that uh, at least you know, with, within Canada, to the extent that you can have uh, vast jurisprudence, so you don't really have as much as you like, but we're, we're always look, looking for more, <clears throat> that uh, you can apply general principles of, of basic economics uh, that is then subject to f a further appeal and further judicial review. So you have this, this greater degree of economic scrutiny that would absolutely um, uh, help <clears throat> um, companies with their certainty of investment. And th that's a big deal, not just in broadcasting, but especially in telecoms, where uh, these kinds of investments in, in very expensive uh, uh, cell phone towers or, or uh, technology that gets uh, you know, the faster internet, uh, better, infra better, more reliable internet, these are you know, multi-decade investments. And these companies need that, that certainty that uh, basic competition law can, can uh, supply them. This kind of the competition discussion kind of leads into another one of the points that you made, Ben, and I'll let John respond afterward. Um, but you would like to see fewer restrictions for foreign ownership. There are a lot of well, foreign ownership in Canadian uh, media companies and telecoms are, is really restricted. Yeah. What would you like to see change? Well, w we we see the f the future being opening up foreign ownership rules. We do not need to worry about foreign ownership. Uh, for telecoms and, um, and broadcasting uh, to the extent that you have the Investment Canada Act there to protect, um, uh, say, uh, from, a, from an investment from a you know, worrisome for foreign owner that might uh, compromise Canadian telecommunication security or conflict with other broadcasting goals. And the other reason we really want to see uh, a reduced, uh, uh, restriction, reduced restrictions on foreign ownership is that the telecoms business is a very capital-intensive sector. It takes a lot of money uh, uh, to invest in these new cell phone towers, these new um, uh, you know, fiber optic cables. And when Canadians are blocked off from, the, from, from global pools of capital, that's going to increase their, cap their cost of capital. Uh, and that's going to lead to higher costs for you, um, you can, uh, as the end consumer. John. Well, I, I, I think that any country which gives up control of its, of its cultural uh, system and broadcasting network is is really committing you know cultural suicide, and yeah, yeah. and you and, and you'll notice that no no nobody does that not even the United States That's right. right so so you know nobody does this right and so, uh, so you know of all the major countries so it's it's important to note that this is something which we must control we must we must hang on to and I would say there's not only do we have to uh, uh, um, strengthen the, the regulation of, 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 Canadi of Canadian broadcasters, but we also have to strengthen uh, our, our, our state broadcasters. So that's, one, that's one advantage we have over the United States, is that we have a very strong, uh, still, uh, uh, Canadian CBC, uh, Radio Canada, and we have to make sure that that is, is strengthened. I mean, right now, it's, if you look at the list of, of, of state broadcasters, that is one of the, the weakest in terms of per capita funding in the world, even though we have two major language groups that we're funding. Uh, CBC funding is one of the weakest compared to, compared to say, BBC. Let's, let's take BBC, which has, you know, oh, they do have a bit of Gaelic, but it's mainly one language group that, that they're broadcasting in. Uh, and uh, they, they, they get much more funding uh, than, than we, they fund in a different way, but much more funding than we do for CBC. And the funding for CBC has dropped dramatically. So that is also another part of strengthening Canadian culture. It's, 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 it's reinforcing those rules, but it's also strengthening the, 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 the state broadcaster. And I think that, that, that that's important. Uh, look, at, we're, we're a small little country next to not only a very large, the only superpower, I think Putin said that. No, he said the United States the other day. He said the United States is the only superpower. Um, but it's not just that it's a superpower militarily and politically, it's a superpower culturally. One of the biggest, the, 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 the biggest industries in the United States is, 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 is cultural export, is cultural programming. And, and, uh, you know, and we're right next to them. And uh, this, is, this is really important, not only in English, it's also important for French. I would mention that French, uh, you know, the over-the-top broadcasters are also having a tremendous impact uh, in terms of French language viewing, not simply in terms of, of English. And they have a really lousy, you try to find how many Quebec programs and Fre French programs are on Netflix, and it's very, very poor. Very, 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 very poor. Fair and enough. there again, they're not regulated. 
If I could just pop in for a quick second, and one curious thing that we've begun to see in the last little bit of research is that countries that have invested heavily in their public broadcasting have a much higher exportability of their shows. For example, Denmark, I don't know if anybody's noticed a plethora of Danish shows that are now airing around the world. In some of these countries, and I looked into it, they, ha they really love showrunners in Denmark. They give the writer or creators more time to develop, but it's because of the, it, it, they've had their expertise developed through the public system, and it's beautiful to watch that coincidence. Public broadcasting investment goes up in the creative industries, export of the shows in that country goes up. We're really starting to find beauty in that pattern. Okay, I just want to see if Eric has anything you want to throw in on foreign uh, ownership. Well, just re regarding Scandinavia, actually, the, okay. it's a yet another region that right now where everybody's talking about because of the dramas they're producing and also the technology that they're producing in order to invest more in niche local <coughs> digital content to be able to compete against Netflix um, and to make sure that there is more competition uh, in, in the space which to, to a certain extent might actually support some of your points in your, <laughs> in your report, uh, Ben. I was going to say I agree with everyone about the role of the CBC. A, a national broadcaster remains one of the very uh, few effective tools that we can have in, in, in the future of, of um, uh, mostly internet-driven uh, 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 content to promote our, our, our stories. It, is this, it can be this natural home for Canadian content. Okay, but can you explain to me, like in your report, like why why change so drastically from going from the seat? Like these are points that I don't necessarily study every day. So why, why do we, um, why are we proposing to change, change so drastically by putting all the powers into the uh, Ministry of uh, of Culture? Because the technology has changed so drastically. Yeah, let me yeah, just jump but, in but here. But why? But still, why should? But that does, doesn't explain the responsibility shift. The just so everyone who hasn't read so the report the is aware. Have change, but. Ben recommends in his report that the, that the funding for programming go to the Canadian Heritage Department, right? That's what you're asking yeah. about right now? Right. So the, the basic principle is that we want to tell Canadian stories. And that can be whatever we, we define it to be. And we just heard, you know, the, what, what, what um, uh, the, the uh, you know, interpretation of Canada, uh, Canadian stories was based on Little Mosque, Mosque on the Prairie. And that's a very important policy discussion for us to have. Uh, we as Canadians, through our parliamentarians, decide this is what we as Canadians, we as we as the government, want to support, and that's how we can that's how we can do it. Uh, it can be part of it can be the idea that we want to we want to protect jobs, and you know that that'll be their decision. Part of it will be that we want to promote uh, uh, other parts of you know Atlantic Canada stories, but there will be other things that uh, society through par through Parliament will want to support, and that's the idea of why we want uh, that to be in Canadian heritage. Fern or Eric, or John, actually, well, is there, I just, I just want to ask, is there a risk of putting it in the Department of Canadian Heritage that the goals then change based on the government that's in charge at the time? That would be my presumption, that there would be tremendous risk in consolidating inside the actual federal government and the, and the major department of the federal government. I just, I don't see the, uh, the beauty in it attaching more responsibility there at all. It can still be an arm's length agency to a certain extent. You can create a certain set of rules uh, set it up, set it up accordingly. John? It's possible. Yeah, I mean, I, probable. I, I, I think that I think that would be a disaster to to yeah. to, to to give uh, the power for cultural regulations, a hundred percent of that power to to the government of the day. Uh, we've seen we've seen in the last decade that the government of the day didn't like particularly Canadian culture. That wasn't one of the big things that they wanted to increase, and and uh, uh, so that if you if you if you had no if you had no CRTC and you had just the Minister, uh, Ministry of Heritage, you would have a very, very partisan outlook on what things should, uh, and, uh, should be done. And that uh, you, you could make decisions there which would influence Canada for decades to come. So at least having these independent, autonomous, regulatory bodies, I think is, is, is a good thing. I think it's a good thing. And, and we should be trying to, to strengthen them, making them more independent and having the best people sit on them and, and, and uh, who are knowledgeable about the sector, but who are not tied to this or that political party, whether it's left or right. I think the last government would probably argue they just liked a different kind of Canadian heritage and history than, than had been under the previous but government because the, the, they, they had all different opinions on that. And the independent uh, regulators, uh, you know, they're not so independent. Uh, if if you have instances like the last uh, federal government giving very clear marching orders to the CRTC that you will you will find in favor of pick and pay, you know, there, there's only uh, there's only a certain amount of independence you can ever instill in, in Canadian 
in Canadian um, pol policy bodies. And, the, you know, and having one body versus another, uh, you know, it's not going to really change the independence. There's always going to be that, uh, that federal overlay. And this is at least one model to make it more direct, to make that support for Canadian content at least direct and, and transparent. Eric. Um, well, the other risk I basically saw is that if all of a sudden we start subsidizing the content creators, um, there's, there's no way to know whether that will actually get picked up by TV. So we could invest a lot of money in great content that ultimately gets broadcasted to no one. I mean, like that was also part of what scared me a little bit with, um, with that report. But that's the risk today, too, with uh, people and with changing technology, with more and more people moving moving towards Netflix or, or um, other, other online, online um, platforms, the, uh, the risks for channels ranging from history to home HGTV, those sorts of things, is, is increasing every day of people having this Canadian content, you know, seeing this Canadian content on TV, but not actually watching it. I, I, didn't, I didn't like a lot of the decisions that the CRTC took re uh, recently on these issues, but I think that what was important about the CRTC, even though it was you know, under weak leadership in the last period, was the fact that they did have the kind of, of hearings which allowed uh, people uh, or organizations of all different uh, opinions to present and, and uh, in a very structured fashion. And uh, that, it's unlike, that would unlikely not happen if it was simply the ministry or the department regulating uh, how uh, you know, money was going to be spent and what, what decisions would be made. Can I just say I agree with John that I, I certainly agree that the CRTC missed a lot of opportunity, not exempting the new media exemption order, not changing rather, or adjusting, or, or accommodating in a long-term strategic way, like what is the creative community in Canada going to need? And what I find difficult about all these different uh, regulators is, is there's very little respect for the actual creative process. There are very few artists on these boards. There's very few cultural champions on these boards. We have a lot of expertise in legal and economic uh, uh, work in this sector, the cultural sector, that's now one of our greatest economic drivers in the country, where kids actually have a chance to work in the cultural uh, industries because it's so mature now. Video games are exploding and morphing every day in our country. And so I'm just trying to find a way to have, have this intelligent, interesting conversation about regulation that's balanced and fair and everybody's on the same level playing field. And we keep making superior work. And you have to make a lot of work to make superior work. You do. You can, I mean, there has to be divorce, diversity of voice. There has, has to be a diversity of opportunity. Um, and can, we, uh, to me, we're just, all this opportunity is there for the harnessing right now. So this, this creative consultation could be, in a way, now beautifully timed. Because we're too late to do the long-term strategic planning. We've got to do it now with the advantage of hindsight. Okay, this is your five-minute warning for audience questions. Uh, I'm going to leave 20 minutes, and if we don't need all that time, then maybe we can come back. But while we're waiting for people to come up with their questions, uh, let's maybe give some closing remarks. If there's something that you wanted to respond to that you hadn't been able to, we'll start with John. We'll work our way. Well, down. I just, I mean, I think we're, you know, we've had sort of two uh, major uh, crises in, in in the last hundred years around culture, and one was resulted in the creation of the CBC, Radio Canada, in the 1930s, and the other was was the all the Canadian content regulations that were brought in in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and, 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 and both of those resulted in really our ability to make uh, strong Canadian programming, you know, from, from, from music to, to, to theater to television, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think that we're now in another, we're another, now in, an, in another crisis situation. And it's how we're going to respond to this situation is going to determine how things are going to go for the next 30 years. So this is a very, very crucial moment. We've got to take the right decisions around these issues. And I think right now we're not on the right track, but let's hopefully that this, the, the, the discussions that the minister, the consultation of the minister is holding will allow us to, to, to finally get on, on, on track with, with, with both regulation and taxation of, of the OTT and the strengthening of, 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 of Canadian programming and funding. I would just uh, say, in closing, that we actually, uh, here on this panel, agree on quite a bit, which is that you know, promoting Canadian content is a good thing. The, the, man, the, the technology is changing and regulations have to change, and we want to create a level playing field uh, among all the different uh, 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 platform, platforms. It's really just a matter of exactly how we do that, and we need to think really hard about exactly what kind of regulation 
uh, is going to work in, in, a, in a world of rapidly changing technology. The technology we have today is not going to be the same thing in five years from now, and that technology in five years from now is not going to be the same thing in, uh, you know, in five years later. And in a world of, of um, regulators with imperfect information, we have to think about the kinds of, the kinds of uh, policies that are going to be resilient to this kind of rapid change. Fair. And there's room for compromise and balance? Of course there is. We're, we're trying to look forward. We're trying to see way down the road strategically. And that's not necessarily what politicians are very good at. They're better at short-term planning and uneven to go way longer. We've had technological disruption all our lives in recorded media, radio, TV, satellite pay. This is just another one, I, you know, in a, in a, in a way. And um, if Netflix contributed to Canadian production funds, then wouldn't they be able to utilize money from that fund to create Canadian content? And we know that in terms of being regulation light or no regulation, that in 1999, the CRTC's policy decisions were disastrous to the creation of Canadian drama and scripted series. They went from zero, from 12 to zero pretty much overnight when they took the opportunity as broadcasters to do infotainment light. We need regulation in our country. It's cheaper to buy programming from America. We all know that. And we have to be vigilant and fierce in, in advocating for Canadian culture. I disagree with, um, with just about everybody on this panel just a little bit. Um, <coughs> Sassy. Um, you know, I, I think just want to maybe not so much a closing a remark, but one of the things I did want to, you know, just bring about is that um, while, you know, we should go and regulate things like um, or platforms such as Netflix, the one thing I'm afraid of is that, okay, well, we can tax them. That's the first thing we can do. But then at best, what Netflix will do is, you know, promote us with the mass head and, and, and visibility on their website for content that maybe nobody will, will watch. And at worst, um, they could say, okay, we'll, we have to do these minimums or we'll invest in it and then we'll uh, shove it away in a deep catalog. So at the same time, because we're in a situation where we're not fed a 35% uh, Canadian content stream or 50% with public broadcasters. How do we do that with, with Netflix and YouTube? Um, so yeah, we can tax them, but it doesn't necessarily um, you know, resolve the, the problem. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of questions from Twitter, and I see some people lining up. So let's take a question from the floor, and then we'll do a qu question from Twitter. Maybe get a bit closer to the microphone and pull it down if you need to. There you go. service here. You know, the, the, one of the very fundamental premises uh, premises of, uh, of um, the HST GST was you create a, a, a wide um, tax base. And so this is a very fundamental reason why you probably should want to think about including uh, services like Uber, uh, uh, Netflix, all these other um, uh, services as part of this uh, part of the HST GST. Couldn't agree more. But this is a this is a much bigger conversation that you're seeing with the OECD through the base erosion and, and profit shifting uh, strategy where we want to make sure that uh, these, the kinds of taxing strategies that we introduce, um, both in Canada and abroad, don't just lead to um, one, one jurisdiction tax, taxing something and just, that just being displaced um, somewhere else. So, so we need to, in cer cer certain circumstances, we need to think about um, international coordination. So in some cases, we, c we can act unilaterally. Okay, so I'm distinguishing here between sales taxes, HST and GST, and in tax. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm wondering then if there are circumstances under which companies that earn revenue in Canada, uh, sh there are circumstances where they pay taxes, then why would we exempt over the top services at all, whether regardless of their ownership? Why? Well, well we have this, in, you have the instance here in Canada of the historical treatment of, of um, um, uh, a business undertaking, and that has changed. The, you know, the, the, the world in which the, the regulations for GST and HST were, were introduced of having when you have a physical pre, uh, presence, 
you know, that the world, of, the world of online services has changed things dramatically. So there is a, a much broader conversation going on about, again, at the OEC level, about a ta taxing these kinds of online services. But what about on their income earned in Canada? Income is different. Uh, we, uh, if it's, um, um, again, the, the OECD has, has, has a lot of things going on on this, and uh, I, would, I would follow whatever, whatever they're, they're doing. Okay. Uh, question from Twitter, and I'm going to ask Fern or Eric to speak to this. How do we engage and invest in the next generation of Canadian content creators? Pretty broad, so <laughs> try to be specific. <laughs> the multiplicity of voices <laughs> argument. Well, I mean, it just goes back to the same thing I was talking a bit of, um, about before, though. Uh, creatively, you have to be able to have access at the beginning of your career, at the beginning of your life, as a woman, as a, as a culturally diverse uh, cr writer, creator, director, producer. You have to have a, uh, find an opportunity to begin, and that seems to be... Um, the greatest challenge that we have in our system to date. There's scarcity in terms of sharing the resources and having these big online broadcasters not contribute to the creation of Canadian content is a hindrance to that multiplicity of voices. Eric, how do we make it uh, easier for the next generation of content creators? Um, or should we make it easy? Well, sure. Maybe it should be like a gladiator then style. Some of the, point, some of the points of the, the some of the ben, points of Ben's report uh, makes sense as well, you know, to subsidize creators directly, because then we are in a world of, of niche broadcasting. Um, and while I, I think we should continue to uh, push, like, mass produce uh, great content that travels, I think also we have a bunch of stories to tell, um, and just and people are doing it already. I mean, like, uh, right now on YouTube, there's like people like Lily Singh from Toronto and and Matt Santoro from Toronto and um, and a bunch of others that are, are, you know, taking their cameras and, and, and they're just filming themselves and they're becoming millionaires because of it. But <clears throat> at the same time, I wonder, like, how much better could their content be if there was also uh, some support and how many others could also have a voice if they had the opportunity to do so? Okay, next question from the floor. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your remarks today. Just wondering if someone could comment on the... Um, and I'm coming at this from a Netflix uh, subscriber viewpoint here, could comment on some of the examples from the other jurisdictions where the tax was sort of brought on and what the implications were. Because I feel like in a lot of these areas and certainly in other sectors, there's the argument that the industry, that the flight argument, that if you do this, we're just not going to be there. But I think in this case, it seems like something that, uh, that the Netflix service would still be provided in the same way and uh, some of the Canadian content could benefit at the same time. So are there any examples from the other places? John has them all, because well, everybody's complying. Yeah, I mean, please, please, please uh, read the report. But, but I mean, if we, just t if we take, if we take uh, uh, Europe, um, you know, Netflix and, and, and other companies uh, tried to avoid uh, collecting VAT, or in other words, our HST, uh, by basing themselves in, in a country in Europe which had a very, very low HST or VAT rate, uh, and that finally was uh, was quashed. And now they have to collect the VAT in the country where the subscriber is based. Okay, and so I mean that's what we should be doing here. In other words, like we should be getting the 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 HST or the PST uh, uh, GST in in some provinces. Uh, that should Netflix should be collecting that and should be remitting it to the, uh, the the federal and provincial governments, and we should be using that for perhaps for for cultural purposes. That would be that would be one good thing to do. So that's that's been done, and also what they're moving into now, and they've already moved in France, and now the European Union is looking at this, is making uh, also uh, Netflix contribute to pro programming development. So the French have already done that. And uh, um, now the Europe is looking at, at, at doing that for the whole of the European Union. So, so this is something which can be done, and 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 which which I mean, uh, Netflix has you know over five million, I think five point two or something million subscribers household. That's households in Canada. They're not going to leave Canada tomorrow. Uh, and they're not going to leave Canada because we were to, we are, we would impose regulations like that when that is happening all over the world. Uh, so I think that I don't th I don't see any problems in us doing that. I think that uh, uh, also 
uh, Netflix can uh, and other companies can create some good programming uh, with with those funds. They they can, as has been said, they can draw on those uh, on, on 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 those budgets. It's not that they have to just give money to somebody else who will create programming. No, they can create programming with those with those funds. So I think that that's that, that's that's positive. And it creates a level playing field. I mean, why should you be able to, uh, 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 you know, wh why do uh, Canadian uh, video on demand services have to have to pay taxes and collect taxes, and Netflix doesn't? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, we're penalizing even our own Canadian uh, competitors uh, uh, by by not by making by, by uh, making Netflix get away with not paying any taxes or collecting any taxes. You, you know, I just find the funny part right now is that we're only really talking about one major platform, too. <laughs> it's like, there'll, there'll be others, but right now it's like, let's start by taxing the one that has a monopoly and, you know, and start regulating them. And Some of the others are free, them right? Contribute a little bit more to but that's right, like content. YouTube is free. Some of the other ones are free, so it's a little bit different. But questions. there's ways of, of working around that as well and finding ways to, well, they do earn money in, in Canada, so there's ways of collecting yeah, but how do you do that? How do you, how do you, again, going back to the idea of creating a level playing field, how do you say, well, Netflix, all your revenue is from, uh, from this content, so that's pretty easy to do. Facebook, there's cross advertising. Yeah, how do you, how do you get that? Well, what percentage of the eyeballs was related to the content and the video? What was it about getting, getting in touch with their friends? Snapchat? How do you tax Snapchat? <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you do this? So if you try to go after the broadcasters, these companies. You're creating this huge CRTC apparatus to tr come up with, you know, a whole bunch of different ways of taxing something that's popping up today. Then they're gonna come up with something tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and it'll never end. Yeah, but you got to start looking at segments because now, you know, we've got broadcasters, and then you have SVOD services like Netflix, and um, and the Canadian competition as well. That you know, those are different segments, and then you have. Um, ad-based vid video on demand, then you have clip-based video like, like YouTube. So I don't think there's, it's not gonna be like a one-size-fits regulation for all necessarily. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah, well, but it's still the, the, broadcasting in a different way, and it's still. It's online uh, broadcasting. You know, yeah, And that's exactly. gonna be the way of our future, and right now what's so lumpy about it is we pick on Netflix just because they're great. I mean, Netflix is fantastic. I have, I have no issue with Netflix. I love Netflix. It's, well, they're, they're, <laughs> it's, it's a good aggregator. There's Canadian content. There's things to like. I don't know why they count Air Bud 5 as a Canadian movie, but nevertheless. <laughs> um, but. But they're, it's just, it's so unequal and that they are exempt from playing in the same pond. It's not that I'm, I'm not adding something terrible to them. They are exempt. Why is one of the richest corporations in the world who will play by the rules of law in the land? At the beginning, they were kind of dancing to see how strong the countries would be. In France, for example, when they moved to Luxembourg, they came back to France and are playing by all the rules. Why should the great, big, huge titans of the world, the multi cultural, these huge companies, be exempt. We've got three questions, I think, left on the floor in about 10 minutes. So maybe if you can each direct your question to one person, that might help us get through <laughs> all three. Well, my question will be for Mr. Duchess. <clears throat> Frédéric Julien, Coalition Canadienne des Arts. Um, actually, I would pick on Fraser, but they're not, they're not here. <laughs> um, so the argument for deregulation is based on the belief that markets are self-regulating, that they achieve a state of balance that eventually promote the barrenness of the markets. Uh, we've seen that uh, the regulation of the banking sector and the stock markets has led to the 2007 and 8 uh, downturn in the US. If we let things go and uh, take the deregulation route, are we not headed towards a cultural downturn? So there are you know, the very premise of government subsidies, having the Competition Bureau get involved, uh, is based on when there is a market failure, when there's a monopoly, when there's this public good that benefits everyone that no one has in a direct incentive to financially contribute to. That's why we talk about the need for regulation, but just a better kind of regulation. That's why we talk about a better, you know, still financing this from some sort of, you know, general pool, but a better kind of way of financing. I guess if I have to pick one person, I'll pick John. Um, but my question is, I guess, a lot of the discussion we've heard today has been around uh, supporting production, um, and it's really been from the point of view of the producers. And it's one half 
of the change that we've seen is, you know, distribution models have changed and all of that sort of thing. But the other half is the consumption patterns, right? And we bumped up against it a couple times. We talked about, you know, burying content in the deep libraries and Netflix. Uh, but, you know, Zarqua mentioned that we're no longer force feeding, right, content the, the way that we had before. And if you listen to her story, a lot of it had to do with she gained exposure to audiences through international media, through the American press, you know, and that sort of thing. And it came back to Canadian audiences as well. But I'm curious about if you guys, it's going to take some creativity to figure out how to increase the discoverability of Canadian content when people have more choices. And I'm curious if you guys have given a lot of thought to that and if you have suggestions, ideas, uh, or practices to, to, to address the other side of the problem of getting Great people question. to choose the content that's created. Well, I mean, I think, I think we have to uh, make sure that Netflix plays by the same rules that uh, the other uh, Canadian companies play by in terms of promotion of, of Canadian uh, programming, where, for example, on, on some of the advertising channels, they have to promote Canadian programming, a certain percentage of Canadian programming. Um, and as you say, otherwise you know, nobody may know about it, right? But so I think that that's important to have those kind of rules that 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 Canadian programming is 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 is, is promoted. I don't know when I go on Netflix, they tell me, you know, this is you should watch this show, and I've yet to find a Canadian have a Canadian any Canadian show ever promoted to me when I go on. But does I that indicate that you're watching all American programming? Well, <laughs> well, that 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 may, no, I watch. I, I'm watching. I'm watching all the the, the Norwegian, Danish, and uh, uh, Scandinavian shows. Um, you're not a Trailer Park Boys fan? Uh, no. Uh, uh, no, I mean it's sure that's that's a uh, that, that's a great show. But when that's the main product that the Netflix has right now, uh, that's not a, that's not a good that's not a good sign in terms of the the really all of the the the. the the variety of Canadian programming, so no, I mean I think it has to, that it has to be promoted, right? Uh, but 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 if the content is not there to start with, I mean there's nothing to promote. So I mean you've got to have that kind of content there, and you've got to be able to promote it. Uh, and I think that once you do that, yeah, people will watch it. We're not saying that they're they're going to watch it exclusively or something, but they but they right now you don't you don't have the choice. The amount of Canadian programming on Netflix is very very small right now, very 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 tiny compared to say on, 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 on either private or, 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 or public broadcasters, uh, Canadian pub, private or public broadcasters. Yeah, and, I'll, yeah, I'll let Fern respond too, but just so everyone's aware, I, was, I went to the Netflix PR people because I knew that we would be talking about them a lot today. And so they provided lists of productions that are underway right now. I, I think I mentioned before, there's a few going on in Vancouver. They just announced today they're doing a co-production with the CBC on the Margaret Atwood novel. So it could be we see more production in the future, but I, I agree. I was trying to find Canadian content on Netflix the other day, and there isn't a category. I suspect we're going to see a lot more Netflix investment in content creation because we're really good at content creation. But I just want to say to the gentleman who asked the question, the CRTC and NFB um, summit they just had, the Discoverability Summit, uh, is going to be a huge part of this conversation because it's not, it's not going to help us all if we make brilliant work and people can't find it. Um, but it seems like a lot of discoverability is found through online suggestion, not just through the algorithms, but through actual you know, blog critics, TV critics, TV critics, online critics. Um, I, I kind of count on all my Twitter feed to ex explode me to the, the next range of possibilities, but it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a big part of this conversation because the world is global. Okay, last question. I, I wanted to say that I, I'm a little troubled that um, so much of the time we spent today focusing on leveling the playing field between Netflix and others and should they pay tax and should others and and I'm concerned that if that's what the consultation ends up being we're kind of missing the point. Um, it seems like you all agreed that the creation of Canadian content requires public funding in some form or another. Uh, and I guess then the question becomes, what's the most effective way to invest that money in a way that's going to create Canadian programming on all platforms? So if I could just quickly get your read on what you would say if, if you were recommending to government the most effective way to invest money, what would be your two things for spending government money to create Canadian content? And let's tell everyone who you are. I, I work for CBC, but I don't, I don't at all uh, am asking you to, to weigh in on the public broadcaster. I'm looking for your ideas about the most effective way to, to generate Canadian programs. 
More prime time. Okay. More prime time visibility for Canadian uh, producers. That'd be one. I think also if you read their reports, they both John and Ben um, take the time to really talk about creating uh, content that's engaging for Canadians and spe really speaks to Canadians. So of course we have a 45 minutes so today, so we're we're talking quite quickly about the regulations and the taxes and stuff. But um, but I think at the heart of it, it's um, these guys are talking about creating good, uh, strong Canadian content. So two things. One, fund the CBC. The CBC will still be an effective mechanism to promote exclusively Canadian content. That might mean a little less of your hockey night in Canada and more of the other things that are just not commercially viable, uh, but would be the sorts of things that would connect with Canadians eventually. Uh, and that would be the second thing I'd, I'd, I'd support uh, with uh, federal government funding, is that the kind of content that no matter, uh, no matter what the commercial viability of it is, connects with Canadians and tells Canadian stories. My quick two, we certainly have a ways to go in investing in the in CBC deeply enough to have the kind of work that we need to see as an effective public broadcaster, and we want to see the money invested go on screen and in the studios and online in real world fabulous content creation. More creators on that board, thank you very much. I think that's going to help us a lot. And number two, I don't have anything better than a currently expanded and continually funded and refreshed CMF because it's a working mechanism right now that is being um, a trigger to incubate new talent. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with that. I mean, first of all, we've got to make sure everybody's contributing that 5%, and that includes uh, Netflix, Google, Facebook as it becomes more and more of a, of a broadcaster. Uh, and, uh, th and secondly, I think we also have got to, you know, double the, uh, the CBC. I mean, we're, 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 we're way below what the CBC got in, in the Moroni, in the last years of the Moroni government. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if you put that in, 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 in 2014 dollars. So, in other words, we're, 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 not doing, we're not doing a good job in terms of funding the CBC, which is going to uh, put an emphasis on producing Canadian pro programming. So I think both of those and, uh, are, are going to be ways which we're going to be able to expand Canadian programming. All right. Great conversation, everyone. Thank you.